Well, hello, welcome to Penrith Baptist Church's first online message for 2024. And uh, we're starting a new series. It's called Setting the Stage. It's based in Genesis chapter 1, chapters 1 to 3. And the reason we called it Setting the Stage is because Genesis chapter 1 to 3 sets the stage for the rest of Scripture. It sets the stage for our life, actually. And we're going to explore that. But before I push into it a little further, I just wanted to us to think through something. I'm wearing my Panthers gear today, and my Panthers gear is an interesting story. And there was a stage which, which was set many, many years ago that I would be wearing this jersey right now. We all have backstories, and Genesis 1 to 3 is the backstory for, for, for faith and for creation and for God's rule and reign in our world. The backstory for me with this is that I have not always been a Panthers fan. See, in 1975, my dad bought a new TV. He's a St. George fan. So the backstory of my Panthers is my dad following St. George. Now, he followed St. George in their era, rugby league club in their era, when they won 11 in a row. I wasn't even around back then. But in 1975, he's got a TV, and we go to watch this TV game, and it's St. George, this iconic club at the time, versus the Roosters. Now, it's, I'm seven years old. I watch this and I just decide after that, when St. George get done 38 nil in the grand final, I'll follow the Roosters. And so for the next 27, and that was they, the Roosters won their grand final, 1975. For the next 27 years, I followed the Roosters. And for 27 years, I followed the Roosters. I lived in the Hawkesbury. wasn't local to where they weren't a local team to me. I just followed them because they beat my dad's team back in 1975. And they flogged them 38 nil. Now, 27 years I followed them. And then they finally won a grand final. And that was in the early 2000s. Then for a period of time, um, I, there, was, there was just a good season with the Roosters. And then in about 2005, uh, Got at that sense of, it was a bit of a God moment. And we started to have a heart, Rachel and I started to have a heart for our local missions and, and all the rest of it. Not just in the Hawkesbury, but in Greater Western Sydney. And so I felt a deep conviction. Well, if I'm going to be passionate about Greater Western Sydney, I probably need to choose a football club in the Greater West. And there was only two, or well, there's three, sort of Canterbury a bit. But there's Parramatta and there was Penrith. And I just went, I think it's time for me to throw. It was just, this, I guess, a decision. I, I want to be full on committed to the region God had called me to serve into. And that was the, the Greater West region, which then transpired into Penrith, which actually then transpired for us actually moving into Penrith uh, in the, in the late, uh, late 2006, about 2016. We started doing ministry in Penrith and then we've been in Penrith now living for the last three years. So I have a backstory to this. And people sometimes see me as a passionate Penrith fan. I'm passionate for the city of Penrith. I love following the Panthers, who wouldn't right now. I picked up following the Panthers, not when they were winning so much. Uh, but my backstory is an interesting one. It started because my dad introduced me to rugby league. And to this day, I've followed sport and, and, and all the rest of it. Well, Genesis 1 to 3 has a backstory for us. It's our backstory. And it's the begin Genesis actually means the beginning or origin. And, and Genesis chapter 1 to 3 uh, is basically all about the beginning, how God created things to be. Now, only, over this series, we're going to tackle a number of things. We're going to see how Genesis chapter 1 sets the stage theologically, doctrinally, spiritually uh, in our experiences. And we're going to look at the first part, the first part of our series will go up to Easter and we're going to look at things like creation and, and, and intelligent design, God's design. We've got Steve Cooper coming in to speak about that. We're going to talk about things like the image of God. These are, these are deep theological, doctrinal, spiritual matters. We're going to talk about fruitfulness. We're going to talk about covenant, how the first covenant was made with Adam and then other covenants that followed on from there. We're going to talk about the devil, how he was introduced in Genesis 1 to 3. We're going to talk about what's called the fall, where there was sin and shame and blame and pride and rebellion and death came into, uh, in, into creation. We're going to talk about the curse in Genesis 3, the consequences of decisions that were made in the Garden of Eden. And then at Easter, we're going to talk about how Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for Jesus on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And we're going to do all that sort of stuff in the first part of our series on setting the stage. In the second part of our series, we're going to pick up some themes that we see 
in in the Genesis one to three, which which work their way out in Scripture. We're going to look at look at things like work, rest, or Sabbath. We're going to look at leadership. What does it mean to have dominion and subdue the earth? We're going to look at relationships. We're going to look at mission and 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 about an expanding kingdom and God's plans. There. We're going to look at worship and intimacy. We're going to look at some themes after we set a bit of a theological and doctrinal. Um, foundation if you like in the first part of our genesis series and that's going to lead us all the way into may now the interesting thing about the setting the stage concept if you like is that so much of genesis 1 to 3 is worked out in fuller expression and ultimately in in, in a really full expression in christ in not just his coming to earth dying rising from the dead giving us new access to the Father, giving us new life, but even his imminent return when he comes again. So that's why we see Genesis 1 to 3 as the setting the stage for the life we are in and for the, the rest of Scripture, setting a foundation. Today, I just want to, it's, it's almost like an intro and a, a, about what Genesis is all about. And I want to sort of divide it into two sections. And the first of these things, first is this, Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for the Creator. Okay, it sets the stage for God. It sets the stage for the Creator. And let me, I'm going to go through some evidence in this, and particularly in chapters one and two. But let's have a look at this. In Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says, In the beginning, God. Right off the bat, in the beginning, God. First words of the Bible created the heavens and the earth. We see in verse three, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We see in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 1, Then God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth, called the firmament. In chapter 9, in verse 9, we see, Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, a dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. In verse 14, this is, Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night, let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. These are all initiated by God. In verses 20, in verse 20, it says, Then God said, Let the, the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. In verse 24, Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, small animals that scurry on the ground and wild apples, uh, animals. And that is what happened. And then we see this climax in chapter one of, of, of God creating human beings. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the earth, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Now, we're going to look at Trinity and we're going to look at what, is it, what does it actually mean in our image. That, that's something that will be looked at as we go through this series. Uh, in, in verse 31, it says, Then God, God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. An evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. The very first chapter of Genesis sets uh, sets the tone that God created, that he created through his word, that God spoke. And we're going to explore that as the weeks go on as well. But basically it sets this foundation or, or, or sets the stage for the creator. We read in, cha in chapter 2, which is uh, uh, another expression of creation in a more detailed space around the Garden of Eden, around the creation of, of humankind. It says this, And then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And we read in verse 9, The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, the trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, so God created Good and he created the, the tree of good and evil. He created the tree of a tree of knowledge. He created the tree of life. He he created the space in where we live, and and he created in the garden. In chapters one and two, he created this paradise, if you like. And then we read into in, in verses eighteen to twenty-two 
Then God said, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept... The Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. We're seeing that God created man and God created woman. God is the creator. He creates from dust. He breathes life. This is setting the stage for, for us, for our life. Where does our life come from? When we ask the big questions, Genesis 1 to 3 was setting the stage for the creator. Now, we can read it and we can read it and go, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. It makes sense. Particularly if we know and love God, we go, yeah, hallelujah, amen. Now, the other thing about Genesis, it was actually written in the context. It's one of the first five books of the Torah. It's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And when it was written, what we, what we know is that there was other ancient pieces of writing that tried to somehow reconcile what life was all about creation stories if you like there was the epic of atrahasis which is mesopotamia or babylonian there was the epic of enuma elish which was a same mesopotamian and these epics or these 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 descriptions of creation they talked about many gods. They talked about the sky, the sea, and the land as, as, as gods. They talked about sun, moon, stars, and sea monsters, and powerful gods, and confrontations between gods, and these sorts of things. Now, the Genesis was written in the context of other pieces of writing which tried to describe how we came about. And it is very, very different. Even, even when it was written, when, the, when Genesis was written, the, there was an ex, the, the people of God had experienced Egypt. And Egypt worshipped the sun god, Ra. Ancient creation theories generally had that humans appeased the creator. Or, or that humans were depicted as accidents of the creator. That's what these ancient theories of creation were all about. In contrast, Genesis, which has humans as the climax of creation... As the desire of God, created in his image and called to steward creation and multiply throughout the earth, to represent Christ to the earth. Pagans' gods really didn't want to have anything to do with humans and were self-consumed. And humans' role was to serve them or appease them or bring food to them. Or, or, or That's how it worked. There was a distance. But here we've got saying God saying we're creating people, mankind in our image or humankind in our image. I love what I read this week, and um, you can see it came through Spoken Gospel when they talked about Genesis 1 and 2. They said, the God who made humans in his own image is the God who came in the image of humans, talking about Jesus. It's the God who made humans in his own image is the God who came in the image of humans. So whereas other creation narratives of the time or, or, or stories of the time painted God as a distant God or painted gods as God's uninterested. This was radical writing about God being the creator, God being humankind being the climax of his creation and then him uh, inviting humankind to, to multiply, fill the earth, serve the earth and be stewards of all that he created in partnership with God. The other way we, we, we Genesis is, sets the stage for us is, is uh, the creator is that things like the Big Bang Theory and the theory of evolution, that they have a sense of randomness about us, a, ch a sense of chance and chaos are often portrayed in these theories. What we see in, in the creation story is, is a sense of order. And Steve Cooper is going to talk about that next week at, at a greater depth. But there is a, there is a, a beginning here. And the beginning is God. And these some in some of our current theories, uh, Big Bangs and, 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 and evolution, oftentimes there's this it it may have come creation may have come from an, a, a single cell or an animal, and there's a sense of randomness, but there's no concrete description of where it all started. But but Genesis chapter one three says this all started with God and us being created in his image. It sets the stage that in the beginning, God is, is not an enemy of science, 
but he's the creator of science. I read this word, these words as I was been get preparing for this series as well. Comfort and hope. Is a, what, what this brings is comfort and hope to people whose experience is marked by chaos, by ugliness, by disorder, by confused emptiness. God is the sort of God who comes into confusion and makes things new, which is what it looks like. He, uh, uh, the words he goes on to say, he hovers over your darkness, like he hovered over the chaos. And, and what we have is Steve Cooper. He's going to talk about more about that next week. Next week. And he says, let there be light over your darkness. And people of God, and then when I read these words, they said, people of God, take heart. This is amazing, this God of order. But even the, the phrase I've used, uh, the, the phrase that Genesis 1 to, 3, 1 to 3 sets the stage for the creator is unhelpful in this series in one sense. In Genesis, it's more about the creator himself sets the stage. We must remember that the creator, the creator is really the one that sets the stage. And that stage in one chapter one to three uh, has some good bits and has some yuck bits that we have to wrestle with. OK, let me but let me talk about what I mean when I say sets the stage. See, we read this in Genesis. We read this, we read this amazing th uh, picture of creation in Genesis. But it's not just a not just a, an apologetic or a, or a or a challenge to the to the other pieces of writing about creation of the time. It's actually a foundation for the rest of the Bible because we read in Psalm 148 and other places, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him from the skies, praise him all his angels, praise him all the armies of heaven, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you twinkling stars, praise him skies above, praise him vapours high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord for he issued his command. And they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Praise the Lord from the earth, you creatures of the ocean depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, wind and weather that obey him, mountains and hills and fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all livestock, small scurrying animals and birds, kings of the earth and all people, rulers and judges of the earth, young men and young women, old men and children. Let them all praise the name of the Lord for his name is very great his glory towers over the earth and heavens that is what we see in genesis 1 and then it's sung about in psalm 48 you see how it sets the stage for the rest of the bible if we go into the new testament a beautiful piece of writing in john chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 in the beginning in the beginning God. Well, here it says in chapter one, in the beginning, the word already existed. And it's talking about Jesus. The word was with God. The word was God. He existed in the beginning with God and God created everything through him. Nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. In Romans eleven thirty six, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. Everything comes from him. All glory to him forever. We read in, one, in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before everything was created, the supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. And he holds all, holds all creation together. You see how Genesis 1 to 3 launches us into the New Testament, into the Old Testament, into the rest of Genesis and launches us and sets a stage for God as creator. The second thing that, that Genesis 1 to 3 is, it sets the stage for creation. The good, or I call the wonderful and the wrestle. Let's have a look at the wonderful. We read in Genesis 1, 28 to 31, that about creation, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, this is talking about, uh, fill the earth and go, this is talking about humankind. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every, every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that, and that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made. He saw where it was good, very good. And evening passed and morning came marking the sixth day 
Another one, in, that's in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, then the Lord God planted a garden in the Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man and he, who he made. This is wonderful. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's, that's a journey that, we're gonna, that gets unpacked as we go on. Then the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you shall surely die. There's the beginning of, of giving uh, opportunity to make good decisions. Opportunity to follow God and to honor him is given there. It's, it's just beautiful. Creation's given a chance to engage and we're given a chance to engage with his, his, his creation. We read then that he says, then the Lord in verse 218, then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who's just right for him. Then the Lord God made a woman from his rib, brought her to the man. And at last the man exclaimed, this is bone, one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from man. And this beautiful picture at the end of Genesis 2. Now the man and his wife were both naked but felt no shame. So this beautiful, wonderful stage is set for creation to thrive, to fill the earth, to, 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 to steward the earth, to work with God on, on, on his plans for the earth, to have intimacy with God, to have intimacy with others. There's created, there's created a relationship, a helper and working together. It's a beautiful, beautiful setting the stage for creation. Now, the beauty of Genesis 1 to 3, it, it, when we, we look at our backstory, a bit, like, a bit like I took at my backstory and I say where it came from, it, it, we look at our backstory and see that's how it's meant to be. But the beauty of Genesis 1 to 3 is it helps us understand that it doesn't look like that now. There is a wrestle. Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for the wrestle we're in. When I was, I was listening to Through the Word, and it's a, it's a great app, actually, by the way, if you want to dig deeper into Genesis, Through the Word, and he called this the worst day ever. And if we read these words. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and let's see the story. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Okay. There's the, the message. And then we read in chapter 3, the worst day ever. The wrestle. The thing that helps us understand our wrestle. Our backstory of where our wrestle came from. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will, you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. Oh, there it is. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted to wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some, some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At the mo that moment, their eyes were open. They certainly were. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig, fig leaves together to cover themselves. Satan had said, or the serpent had said, your eyes will be open. Now, Adam and Eve were already created in the image of God. They were given all they needed to know. But the temptation they, they, they fell to was to be like God. They were both there. Adam and Eve were both there. The idea of being self-sufficient. We'll know good and evil. We'll know to be independent of the creator. Creation becomes a God. That's the aim. Creation becomes a God. Think of the emperors in history. Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, Roman emperors, Egyptian pharaohs. All were seeking to say, I'm a God, were worshipped as gods. Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for the constant ongoing quest that humans have to be like God. We see it in the Tower of Babel really excelling and then God confusing and moving powerfully in there. But Genesis 1 to 3 starts that process and sets the, uh, sets the stage for this independent life that we long for, this self-sufficient life that, that we move towards, this abandonment of our Creator. 
And unfortunately, what happens is when our eyes are opened, we, we, we quickly end up in, in, our, in sin and rebellion. And that gives way to shame. And we see it gives way to blame. I will talk more about this in, in, in a later time. But Genesis 1 to 3 helps us understand. It helps us understand. We go on and we read, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking out in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied. Where are you? He replied, I heard you walk in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. This is called the fall. This is called the fall. And we live in the fallout. It sets the stage for what we live in. For an understanding why we try to be self-sufficient, independent, why we experience shame, why we shift blame. We live in the fallout of what Bible, the Bible calls the curse, a result of the worst day ever. And there was three things that broke down, broken and difficult. There was broken and difficulty in relationships between each other. We see this in Genesis 1 to 3. Now, that, set, that, that escalates very quickly. Uh, Cain and Abel have children. And an example of this is we read that, um, that Cain and Cain kills Abel. They bring an offering to God and, and, and we read that when, when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to God, to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs for his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. Cain gets angry, it goes on. And then there's these, these words that, that Cain says, why are you so dejected? Just, just worship right. Um, you'll be accepted if you do what is right, God says. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out because sin is, these famous words, because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and master it, um, God says to Cain. Well, he didn't do that. He ended up murdering his brother broken relationships now we know that um hebrews talk about setting the stage genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for the new testament and when hebrews looks back on this it says it was by Hebrew, chapter verse chapter 11 verse 4 it was, says it was by faith that abel brought a more acceptable offering to god than cain did abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and god showed his approval at his gifts Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. So even there, there's choices like they were in the garden. Do you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Cain had a choice to bring right offering to God, to, 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 to do it out of that. Abel's heart was his best fruits, his first fruits. But the, and then it turned into broken relationship with each other. But there's also broken relationship with, with creation. Cursed ground we see, and that'll be talked about later on. A very good creation, remember? And it was very, very good. It's broken down by sin. And, it, and, and when we, we think now, it set the stage for what we see now. We know it well in Australia. Fire, flood, disease. Paul writes beautifully about this, how creation groans for a future hope. He says this in Romans chapter 8. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that day, that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of our future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised us. So creation, there's a brokenness between creation and, and, and God and, cre and creation and us. And, and that gets that we creation groans for the day when we're restored to that Genesis 1-2, where we're restored as we groan for the day. 
The other relationship, so there's a broken relationship between uh, people. Um, there's a broken relationship between creation and people and creation and God. And there's a broken relationship between God. That's the most important one. Cast out of the Garden of Eden. And we've lived in that. And it set the stage for that to be restored, restored by Jesus. We see in Genesis chapter 7, it really, it moves quite rapidly to broken relationship with God, with the flood. But we've seen the, the, these good things where Noah finds favour with the Lord. We see that uh, when, when the Lord was sorry he had ever made humankind and put them on earth, it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I'll wipe out the human race I've created from the face of the earth. We see a broken hearted God over, over it, it, it actually says the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was constantly and totally evil. Evil had taken its place. And we're going to explore that as we go, for, do, do, go forward in this series. But we do have these little beautiful moments. Even Hebrews 11, 7 reaches back about Noah and says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So it's, we have a messy world, but Genesis 1 to 3 helps explain it. This broken relationship with each other, with God and with creation. Genesis 1 to 3, as hard as it is, is still a stage of, for hope. Grace is offered by God as he, as he makes clothes for Adam and Eve. Grace is offered by God when we look at the last chapter of the book of Revelation, where we see the tree of life available again, anew. Someone, I remember when someone once said, we live between the trees of Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation. And our life is lived in, in this Genesis 1, 2 and 3. But there's hope in the midst of that. You know, I'm going to read to you something else uh, about this setting the stage, just, to, just to, as a taster for Easter. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, the scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. More will be talked about by that. But Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for us to understand the world that we're in now. And it's filled with our, our wrestle and our wonder, our hope and our struggle. We get an understanding where death came from. As we rem remember that uh, when God warned Adam and Eve that you will taste death if you eat from the knowledge, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. To finish up, Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for what we see and experience all around us. How human life can be so rich and prosperous and yet so flawed. How it can be that human beings so much long for God, that we, we cry out for God and yet so instantly flee from him and try to be like him. How human beings can create so much that is of excellence and beauty only to find that our finest achievements are subject to decay. Moth and rust, it's, as Jesus said. While even some of our most intimate and, and life-giving aspects of human relationships are, uh, are, are wonderful to experience, but they are, are touched with often with pain and sorrow and everything is overshadowed by death. Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for what life restored in Christ can look like. How we can still live out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Work, worship, intimacy, rest, love, relationships, eternal life. Genesis 1 to 3 sets the stage for our understanding, not just how things were created, but why things are the way they are now. The wonderful, the wrestle. 
and the longing for the restoration when Jesus comes again. I hope you really enjoy this series. I hope it sets some wonderful foundations for us all. And I've explored, so I've, I've gone and given this big general overview. We're going to dig deep over the next, right till through to May. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you so much that Genesis is written. And I pray that the, the story in Genesis the experience of, of pushing into Genesis for Penrith Baptist Church will give us a deeper understanding of the world around us, your created world. But most of all, give, give us a deeper understanding of you as our creator. I pray that we would learn, that we would grow. I pray that most of all, that we would go through this season and get a deep and rich and full understanding of what it is to me be created and what it is to have you as our creator. And I pray that we'd understand Jesus, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. I pray that we would understand that beautiful Trinity relationship that we, that we see in Genesis, but, is it, but that, that set the stage for it to be lived out. God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, God. Lead us on a journey of understanding you as our creator. Amen. Well, next week we've got Steve Cooper talking about the create the created world. And it's going to be pretty cool. See you later.